So now that we know what rings and ideals are, do you remember a few weeks ago at this point, we were talking about solutions of polynomial equations, and we kind of raised the question, well, some polynomials have solutions that are rational numbers, some polynomials with rational coefficients. Some of them have solutions that we have to go up to the real numbers and get square roots or nth roots or whatever. Some of them we have to go all the way up to the complex numbers to get solutions for. But somehow, even just going from the rationals to the reals is already a big jump, because we go from a situation where we generally have no nth roots at all in the rationals to a situation where suddenly we have all of the nth roots, at least of the positive uh, real numbers, within the reals. So why do we need to take such a big jump from rationals where we have no nth roots all the way up to reals where we have all the nth roots? Is there anything in between? And so the purpose of the next thing we're going to do is to look at the situation where we're going to take the rationals, or actually today it's just going to be the integers, and just tack on one additional number to the integers to make a new ring in which we can take the square roots, but not just square roots of everything, maybe just the square roots of a single thing. And that new ring that we get over here is going to be called a quadratic extension of the integers. So the first question is, what does a quadratic extension of a ring look like, or the quadratic extension of the integers in general? And then secondly, how does this tell us something about factorization? Can we learn something about how to factor polynomials later on by dwelling for a minute on what the question looks like for quadratic extensions of the integers? So what does factoring look like in a situation of the quadratic extension of the integers? And what can it tell us about factoring in a more general setting? So we're going to get started right away with one more bad pun of the week. Before you die, you see the ring. You see the ring. You see the ring. Oh, oh, sorry. All right. So again, two-step program. First of all, what is a quadratic extension of a ring, specifically the integers? And then second, what does it tell us about factorization? And we're going to bring in a, a new object today called a norm function. And a norm function is going to help us to understand whether a certain number within a quadratic extension may be factored. So let's get going. So again, why we're interested in quadratic extensions of rings is that this is going to be a construction that's going to serve us very well, not just in the study of rings as we're going to do today, but it also is important in the more general context of fields as well. And the idea behind a quadratic extension is that we're just going to take a ring like the integers or maybe a field like the rational numbers, and we're just going to throw in a single square root that wasn't there before. So the motivation for this might come from uh, a construction on the real numbers. So the moral of the story is we're trying to tell this number field something that it doesn't know. So if I start with just the field of real numbers, the field of real numbers is great for a lot of things. If I have real numbers at my disposal, then I can do things like study linear equations, because all those solutions will be real if the coefficients are real. I can measure scalar quantities, which is why scientists love the real numbers. I can do one-dimensional geometry, which is not very interesting, right? We can measure lengths, but not a whole lot else. Um, but the real number system is great for a lot of purposes. But it has its limitations. The real numbers are not so great for doing any kind of geometry in more than one dimension, so measuring an area. Uh, it's also not great for measuring a directed quantity, like a vector quantity, a velocity vector, or something like that. Um, it's also not even so great mathematically for solving quadratic equations, because not every quadratic equation in the reals has a solution that's a real number. So if we want to address some of these limitations, let's think about throwing in something new. So I'm going to take the real numbers and I'm going to attach to it some new object, some new number. Uh, and the requirement is that this new number not be a part of the real number system itself, specifically that it be linearly independent of the field of real numbers. So if I specifically want this new object to give me the power to solve quadratic equations, let's just declare that this new object is the square root of negative 1, which we may also know as i. But just throwing in i by itself isn't really enough. There's a limitation to what we can do just with i. We would also like to be able to work with all of the multiples of i. We would also like to be able to work with the result of adding a multiple of i to a real number. So this new thing isn't so much good by itself. So what we want to do is complete the extension by constructing what is essentially a two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers, of which one of the new basis, ve uh, basis elements, basis vectors, is my new number that I've thrown in called i. So this is now a two-dimensional vector space over the reals. And as a vector space over the real numbers, its basis might be considered to be uh, 1 and i. So 1 is the basis vector from my original field of reals, and i is the basis vector that gives me something new. 
So the real numbers are still a part of this picture. They're lying underneath here. In our geometric example, it's really the x-axis. But because we've added in this i, now we have some new freedom that we didn't have before, um, that I can sort of go north and south in addition to east and west. And I can roam over this entire two-dimensional plane that we call the complex plane. And any number, like negative 1 plus i, inside of this new uh, number system also has what we call a conjugate, which we get by just reversing the imaginary part and making it into negative 1 minus i. Um, and taking the conjugate of a com the entire field of complex numbers in this example um, does something. It reflects over the x-axis. But most notably is what it doesn't do is it doesn't change the value of anything that was a real number to begin with. Every real number is its own conjugate. So we get actually a lot of new structure. And we didn't have to do a whole lot to get it. So we got all of this for the low, low price of one additional i. All we had to do was adjoin i to the field of real numbers. And suddenly, we've got something brand new. Notice the notation that we use for this is very similar to the notation that we use for a polynomial ring. And there's a reason for that, because this new field really is just a polynomial ring over the reals, except instead of a variable building my polynomial, I have a number i, which is going to serve the the, uh, the, take the place of that variable. And so because i squared is equal to negative 1, we don't get these polynomials that can go on for a whole bunch of terms. All of our polynomials are going to stop just after two terms, because as soon as we get to i squared, we're back to the real number negative 1 again. So this is our motivation, that extending the real numbers to the complex numbers by just throwing in an i um, is a process that we'd like to generalize to a situation of different fields besides the real numbers, and also rings if we can get away with it. So before we get to this completely general idea. Again, remember what it is that we're doing. We're taking a ring, or maybe a field later on, and we're just throwing in an additional number. And we'd like to do this in as simple a fashion as possible. And the simplest way to do that is to throw in something that when we square it, when we multiply it by itself, we get a number that's in my original field again. So that when I build polynomials with this new number as one of the variables in the polynomial, then those polynomials don't go on forever. They stop as soon as we get to the square of that thing. So what we get is going to be called a quadratic extension of this ring. So let's look at the more general definition. A quadratic extension of the integers is what we get when we take a number, capital D, which is not a perfect square of another integer. So in other words, this is going to be something new, like the square root of 5 or the square root of negative 15 or whatever. Um, and then we're just going to throw that in um, by making the linear combinations a plus b times square root of d. And we call it an extension because the integers themselves lie within this, right? They're a subring within this quadratic extension ring. All we have to do is choose little b to be equal to 0. Now, how do we do arithmetic in one of these quadratic extension rings? All we really need is the distributive property that characterizes a ring and the agreement that when we square this funny number, square root of d, uh, that we get d back. And d was an integer, so we know what to do with it. So for example, in z adjoined square root of 6, uh, if I want to multiply these two numbers, negative 2 plus 3 radical 6 times 1 minus 9 radical 6, then the distributive property tells me I should FOIL. So first outside, inside, and last. And then when I get to the last, the product of 3 radical 6 minus 9 radical 6, I need to know that the square root of 6 squared gives me 6 back. And now just combining the like terms, I can get what the product of these two numbers is in z adjoined radical 6. Now inside of this, we also have a function called a norm function. And as I promised, the norm function is going to help us decide whether or not a number is factorable, whether we can factor something. And the way the norm function works is it just takes a number, which is in this quadratic extension ring, and it multiplies it by its own conjugate, as we'll see. So first of all, we call it a norm function in kind of a, a weak analogy to other norms that you might know from elsewhere in mathematics, vector norms, norms on topological spaces, and so on. But it does have a couple properties that distinguish it, because this is what we're going to call an arithmetic norm. It's a norm that is going to uh, tell us something algebraic about the structure of our extension ring and later our extension field. And again, how we construct this norm function, aside from the formula that I have down at the bottom of this slide, in more generality, we just construct it by multiplying a number by its own conjugate. Remember, the conjugate is just going to take this new number and trade it out for its own additive inverse. Uh, and if I multiply a number by its own conjugate, then I get its norm. So that's what we're going to think of as being a norm. And we're going to see over the course of the next couple videos what the purpose of having a norm is, what it can do for us. So I want to close this video with a very rich example called the Gaussian integers. The Gaussian integers are nothing more than the quadratic extension of the integers where d is equal to negative 1. So these are integer-like complex numbers. We're going to start with the integers and then introduce the integers to the number i. And then by completing this extension, 
In other words, by looking at all of the uh, z linear combinations of the integers and the number i, we're going to get an entire new ring called the Gaussian integers that looks a whole lot like the complex numbers, except it doesn't include anything in between these points. It's just a lattice of points. It doesn't include uh, you know, everything in between. We can't draw a straight line. We can draw some points. And again, the integers are still here underneath. right? They serve the same function that the real numbers did when we extended the real numbers to the complex numbers. It's our base ring, we might call it. So it's still here in our x-axis. But now we have some new stuff. 5 plus 4i now belongs to the Gaussian integers. And its conjugate, 5 minus 4i, is a Gaussian integer. We can do arithmetic in the Gaussian integers, specifically addition and subtraction that look exactly like the addition and subtraction on the xy plane, r2. Right? If I have these two vectors, uh, then adding them together, we can do by the parallelogram law. The sum of 5 plus 4i and negative 1 plus 3i is 4 plus 7i. And that completes this parallelogram. We can also do multiplication. And multiplication in the Gaussian integers looks exactly like multiplication does in the complex plane. If you're not familiar with how this works, how you multiply two numbers geometrically in the complex plane is we take my vectors 3 plus i, negative 2 plus 2i. And I'm going to measure the magnitude. So 2 square root of 2 would be the magnitude of negative 2 plus 2i. And I'm going to measure the angle that that vector makes with the positive x-axis here, 135 degrees. And to multiply 3 plus i by that vector negative 2 plus 2i, I'm going to first stretch 3 plus i by a factor of 2 radical 2, which was the magnitude of that uh, other vector that we're multiplying by. And then I'm going to rotate by that angle 135 degrees. And the result, negative 8 plus 4i, is the product of 3 plus i and negative 2 plus 2i. Shocking, but you can check it. So we can do arithmetic with the Gaussian integers the same way we do arithmetic with the complex numbers. The only difference is that uh, we're putting in integer-valued complex numbers, and we're getting out integer-valued complex numbers. But now the operative question is, what about division? Can I divide by a Gaussian integer? Where are my units? So what we're going to do is use the norm to answer this question. Remember, the norm is the product of a Gaussian integer with its conjugate. So 1 plus 2i, its norm is going to be the product of 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i which turns out to be 5. And again, the norm ends up being an ordinary plain vanilla integer and not a Gaussian integer, which is really, really helpful for reasons we'll see in our next video. <clears throat> and I'm going to make a claim that the units in the Gaussian integers are exactly those elements of the Gaussian integers that have a norm equal to plus or minus 1. So x in the Gaussian integers is going to be invertible if and only if the norm of x is positive 1 or negative 1. And the question is, what do those numbers look like in our diagram over on the left? Well, since the norm of a plus bi is a squared plus b squared, I'm looking for the set of all Gaussian integers such that a squared plus b squared is equal to 1. But what does that look like? That's exactly this unit circle in the complex plane. Hence, by the way, the term unit. It's not an accident that we use unit to refer to this. This may be one of the reasons why. So what are the unit Gaussian integers? They're exactly those Gaussian integers that lie on this unit circle in the complex plane. There are four of them, plus and minus 1 and plus and minus i. So in the Gaussian integers, there are exactly four units. And they're exactly those that have a norm equal to 1. That's actually a process that's going to generalize. That's going to be good not just for the Gaussian integers, but in general for any quadratic extension of the integers, that the units are exactly those elements that have norm equal to plus or minus 1. So right away, the norm is telling us something deep about the nature of the the multiplicative properties of this extension ring. That's something we're going to hang on to in our next video when we start to look more generally at quadratic extension fields and what the norm has to do with whether or not a number in that ring or that field is factorable.